Um, we were pleased uh, this afternoon to be interviewing Dr. Lawrence Carter, the Dean of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel at Morehouse College. My name is Marcellus Barksdale. I'm a member of the faculty at Morehouse College and um, in the Department of History and African American Studies, and I have worked on the Morehouse Sesquicentennial Project. Today is August the 19th, 2016, and we're very pleased to welcome you, Dr. Carter. Thank you. As we get started, I think we need to get a little background on, on, on you as, uh, uh, as, as a scholar. When and where were you uh, born and, and grow up? Mm -hmm. I was born in Dawson, Georgia, September the 23rd, 1941. It's in Terrell County. And I was there until I was five. Five days after I was born, I was taken to the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. And I didn't learn this until after I had uh, finished seminary, after I had gotten married and was ordained. But five days after I was born at that church, uh, my mother told me, well, one evening we were watching Alex Haley's Roots with my new wife at our home in Columbus, Ohio, that my grandmother, without telling anybody what she was going to do, took me in her arms and walked up and stood in front of the congregation and prayed out loud, Lord, make this boy a preacher. Well, no one had ever in my family tried to influence what I would do, and no one ever hinted that that experience had happened. But clearly it had a profound impact on me because my little ears, five days old, were the closest to my grandmother's lips. And there I was, I was so undone that I had to walk out of the house. And I walked up and down Oakley Avenue trying to fathom the power of prayer. But in my fifth year, I became a part of that great migration north. My mother had already gone up looking for work. My father was in the military. And I was taken up uh, at my grandmother's passing in 1945 to uh, live in Columbus. And I grew up there going to kindergarten, elementary, junior and senior high school. And uh, had all of my real formative experiences there and left Columbus in 1960 to go off to college. It's fascinating because when I was in the 10th grade, Martin Luther King Jr. himself, in a private encounter at the Union Grove Baptist Church, pastored by a Morehouse alumnus, Dr. Thayle Hale, after church that morning, I had a habit of asking to look at the studies of the pastors as I was considering the ministry, and so I asked Dr. Hale, could I see his library? And he said, yes, go right in, there's no one there. Well, I walked in, closed the door, and started looking at his shelves, and I, as I turned completely around to go to another wall, Dr. King was seated in a chair, had been staring at me all the time. I've often thought, it's a good thing I wasn't a thief, he would have caught me dead. <laughs> <laughs> And he struck up a conversation and he said, um, what's your name? I said, Lawrence Carter. He said, have you considered college? I said, yes. He said, uh, have you considered Morehouse? I said, yes, but some neighbors talked me out of it. He was very surprised and he started to uh, argue why I should reconsider Morehouse. Well, the neighbors and the officers of the church thought because I was interested in ministry that I should go to Virginia Seminary and College in Lynchburg because it turned out so many great Baptist pastors in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Mm -hmm. And our pastor who <coughs> baptized me had been a professor there of Hebrew. And so that's where they sent me. Though my mother wanted me to go to the Ohio State University. <laughs> I was afraid of going up there because I didn't want to be a statistic. <laughs> 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 but in my second semester, Dr. King came to Lynchburg to speak. And my math teacher, Dr. John Daniel Manning, took me 
to the E.C. Glass High School, the city's largest auditorium, seated 4,000, to hear him. It was the most powerful speech I think I can say I ever heard in my life. Tell us a little bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Why would you con consider that the most powerful speech? Mm -hmm. I'm just curious. Well, the first thing I can share with you is that uh, it was a capacity crowd. And four times in that speech, he lifted us out of our seats with our arms above our heads, screaming, yes, affirming what he had said. He was introduced that night by Dorothy Cotton. And she told us that he had two addresses that he used as he crossed the nation to introduce himself to the American people in what he called his people to people campaign. Now this was, um, this was 1961, um, his spring. And she said, I don't know which speech he's going to give, but you will not forget it. And what he did in that speech was to talk about the urgency of the civil rights movement and the work of SCLC, uh, voter registration, and he did a philosophical analysis of what was wrong with segregation and how it was separate and not equal. And we got a history of racism in this country. But it was such a wonderful address of sociology and psychology and theology and scripture and the nation state papers. It was like a, a civil sermon or a civic sermon. <laughs> It was very educational. He used no notes, a magnificent memory. And the oratory on the end of it, I had never heard at that age the English language used so magnificently. And when it was over, I was a different person than I was when I came in. I rushed back to the campus and called my mother and said, I'm transferring to Morehouse College. Well, I did not know that my mother was working three jobs to put me through. And she said, no. I was stunned because my mother had never said no to any of my aspirations, particularly regarding education. <coughs> and so we ended the call, I hung up the phone, and I sat there in a profound silence because I knew that I was at a major turning point in my life. And before I moved, I made a decision that I have never regretted. I decided, well, if I cannot go to Morehouse College and be taught by some of the same people who taught him, and I will do the second best thing. I will go to Boston University for the rest of my education where I will surely get what he got. Wow. And so, without telling my family, I borrowed money from my psychology professor, Dr. C.M. Cofield, to take the Greyhound bus to Boston University to look it over. That was a decisive trip. I stayed a whole day, and I was hosted in the home of Dr. Virgil Wood, who was one of my college professors, but who had moved to Boston and was the head of SCLC in Boston. And I went to classes in the School of Theology. I talked to people in Marsh Chapel, and my last meeting was with the Dean of the School of Theology, Dr. Walter George Mueller. I've always described him as the Benjamin Mays of Boston. <laughs> and standing in his office with a Greek New Testament in his hand, as he turned the pages, he told me why 
I should enroll at Boston University School of Theology. And he told us that BU, told me that BU had a long history of admitting uh, Negroes mm -hmm. and graduating them at all levels. But he said there were no blacks for the first time admitted to the School of Theology the previous year. And he said that, that cannot happen again. So when I got back to Virginia, I applied immediately. And to my shock, I was accepted, completely accepted, unconditionally in my junior year. I had not even gone through my senior year. I was accepted with my transcript. And when I announced that at my school and at my church, Court Street Baptist, and it went all through the city, I was a city-wide celebrity. That's and a big achievement. It mix. was, it just lifted me. Yeah. And considering all that has happened, I have never regretted it. It was the best decision I ever made. And <laughs> truly, the rest <laughs> has been history. <laughs> Certainly, we want to come from um, Boston um, and then to Atlanta as the, as the dean. But if I may go back to that wonderful experience you had at uh, that uh, speech that Dr. King gave. Yes. Who sponsored it, and did mm. he have any of his associates with him that night? I think it was, uh, yes, he did have um, a number of them. But... <coughs> He was sponsored by the leadership of the movement in Lynchburg. So I can say with confidence that Virgil Wood, who was pastor of the Diamond Hill Baptist Church and who led the movement in Virginia, <laughs> and the pastors uh, of the city, my pastor, Harold A. Carter of Court Street Baptist, <coughs> had been at Dexter one of Dr. King's assistants while he was at Alabama State. And uh, at the same time, you might uh, be aware that John Porter was one of his assistants. And the black leadership of the city, I can no longer call the name of the man who owned the largest black funeral home there. I can see his face and I'm sure he was one of the sponsors. And let me tell you what makes me so certain that he was. <laughs> Because after I arrived in Atlanta, Mrs. King, the summer of 1979, invited me to her home on sunset on a Saturday. And uh, we had conversation at her dining room table. And in the course of the conversation, I told her about Dr. King's speech at the E.C. Glass High School and the effect that it had on me. And I said to her, you know, I wonder if you can tell me if that speech was recorded. And I was quite amazed when she said, no. She said, it's just unreal. But she said, uh, those speeches that he gave across the country, not one recording has appeared. And I found that just shocking. And so do I. But wait a minute. Well, one day, I don't know whether it was one year later or two, <coughs> I had much more free time in the summers and I drove over to the King Center, was looking through the bookstore. And as I was looking at the different counters, I came across on sale cassettes. And I innocently picked one up and looked at it to see the title, because it was advertised as Speeches of Dr. King. And it was titled, The American Dream, Lynchburg, Virginia, 1961. I was so excited, I literally screamed. Everybody in the <laughs> store turned to see what had happened. 
And I was saying, I found it, I found it, I found it. <laughs> and of course, oh they didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> and I reached for my wallet and discovered I had driven over there without my wallet or my license. <laughs> I panicked, put the cassette down, rushed out the door and said, I'll be right back. Came across the city back to the campus very carefully, because now <laughs> I knew that I was not legal. <laughs> Went in the house, got the bill for, rushed back over there, bought the cassette, rushed back and put it in the recorder, and I was there all over again. So when I saw Mrs. King, I told her that I had found this in the bookstore. And she said, you won't believe this. She said, the man who owned the large black funeral home in Lynchburg recorded it and sent it to us with a note. I thought you might like to know that we had this. Well, you see, that was my, my <laughs> interest uh, because very often people in the audience mm -hmm. or people who were not officially a part of the program mm -hmm. will record. Yes, And yes. funeral homes across the South played a very exactly. important role in the civil rights movement. And they probably provided his limousine yes, service. Exactly, exactly. So I have that cassette today. It's in my garage in an acid-free box, but I got over 100 boxes in there. And I couldn't tell you which box is in, but I got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, at the end, I'm going to ask you about your collection and where you're going to yeah. um, have it uh, oh, archived. Yes. But before we go there, who, who is associates? Can you recall one or two of the associates that were with Dr. King that night in Lynchburg? Well, I mentioned Dorothy Cotton, who introduced him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see the other gentleman, short with glasses, who has now passed. And I was just at Andy's house a few days ago and asked for his name. And he told me, and I cannot recall it. Mm -hmm. If you called off the names of those people around him, I would recognize mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was a minister, and he was always seen with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but see. but Abernathy. Um, I didn't see Abernathy. And um, Andy or Joe Ner Joe Lowry. I, I don't believe that okay. Andy was on board yet. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This is now 61. He, he may have been because he met Andy over in Alabama at mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. college yeah. outside Jacksonville. Uh, uh, what is that? Outside Huntsville. You uh, mean? Um, no. Uh, in Jacksonville? It wouldn't be. In Mississippi? Not Tougaloo. No, it's in, let me see, no. Are you talking about Alabama? Yeah, no, it would be in Mississippi. What's the, co the co black college? Not not, uh, not where Hefner was, but it's a black college. Mississippi Valley, Alcorn, Jackson no, State no, no, is no. the biggie. Yeah, Jackson is the big one. That's where Hefner was. Yeah. But um, I don't they know. were on a panel together. Mm -hmm. But that picture is upstairs in the African Hall of Fame. But um, no, I know others were there, but I only remember Dorothy because she introduced him. Uh, Let's get back to Boston then. That, okay. that was a wonderful experience <laughs> in um, Lynchburg that night. And mm -hmm. you know, I can kind of transport oh, yeah. myself back oh, yeah. uh, to that time. I wasn't there, but you did a good job of describing <laughs> the emotions oh, and the mood something. and the feeling. Now you're at Boston. Tell us a brief uh, overview of your years at Boston University. Well, there were predictions uh, that I wouldn't make it at Boston. Uh, By whom? Who were the? Oh, they were just the noises at the edge. Okay. None of the. Uh, let me just give you an example. Um, the faculty used to discuss the students at their meetings and their progress. And this is at? At BU, School of Theology. And um, I had uh, three roommates. It, there were four of us uh, in three rooms. Our bedrooms were on um, both sides of a study in the middle. And each one of us had our desk in the middle room in corners. And uh, all my... Uh, roommates were Anglos, and uh, I would say their undergraduate education was stronger than mine. So I knew that I was going to have to really 
and be disciplined and steady and husband my time wisely. And so when they went out, I didn't. I stayed right at my desk. I didn't do entertainment, uh, no movies. I studied because I had a very slow reading speed and uh, my roommate, uh, Lee Weber, who would become the best man of my wedding, he uh, was a speed reader and uh, he had a huge vocabulary and a wonderful speller. <laughs> <laughs> and he was most encouraging, but we all worked at the, one of the big dorms in the evening in the cafeteria. <coughs> And Dr. John Mays, a member of the faculty, came to see me. The dormitories were the top two floors of the School of Theology, and uh, the faculty offices on the third floor, the library was on the second floor, and the classroom was on the first floor right in the heart of the university. And uh, he took me to lunch in the faculty dining room of the university. I was most impressed, <laughs> <laughs> looking out over the Charles. And he said, um, the faculty uh, have made an observation of you, that you have perhaps the highest social intelligence of anyone in your class but they've noticed that you don't test well and they are having a hard time figuring out uh, what's going on. He said, tell me a little about your background. So I gave him a little history and some of the problems I had had academically and how it wasn't until the fifth grade that a teacher actually kept me after school to teach me to read that I had not learned how to read. And uh, a fascinating thing that I should probably reveal is that I had gone to uh, black schools up until the fifth grade. And then we moved across town <coughs> because urban renewal was really urban removal. So when we moved across town to our new home, it was an integrated community. And I went to a, a majority school. And I was placed in the fifth grade again. And in class, um, <coughs> I had a very uh, embarrassing but necessary experience. About 30 to 35 students in this fifth grade class. And Josephine Clark, a very young, Caucasian uh, woman with long blonde hair sat at her desk and called on every student in the class to read. And I was going to be near the last of the students reading because I was on the opposite side of the room. And everybody did well. Everybody did well. And I remember I was not nervous, but I knew I wasn't going to do well. Mm -hmm. And then she said, Lawrence, and I started to read. And I started to miss words. And the students started to snicker. And I remember I started to smile also. And I started to miss so many words, she called on the next student. And when the reading class dismissed, she said, Lawrence, may I speak to you after class? And uh, she, everybody left. And from her desk and me from my seat, we talked. Just the two of us. She said, you're having trouble reading. I said, yes. She said, would you like me to teach you to read? Oh, my God. <laughs> A big grin came across my face. It was like salvation <laughs> at last. And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, you'll have to stay after school. 
And I said, that's all right. And I don't remember how many, how many days and weeks we sat together. Mm. Mm. Dr. Barksdale, let me say, that's just one of the reasons why I could never hate white people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can understand. That's just mean. one. Yeah. yeah. Because she didn't realize that as a kid growing up, we had a bookcase in our house full of books that belonged to my aunt. And I used to sit in front of that bookcase, a little red bookcase, and mm -hmm. take the books off one at a time and look through them. Some of the books had pictures, most of them didn't. But I always believed the books contained great secrets. And I wanted to know what they were. And my mother and aunt couldn't understand why from the first grade to the fifth, I was not learning to read. Mm. <coughs> and my aunt used to read to me, but one day I rushed to get the newspaper and I brought it to her for her to read to me. And she looked at me and she said, I'm not going to read to you. She says, I want you to learn how to read. And she walked out of the room. And I sat there with the newspaper, just mm -hmm. staring. Mm -hmm. I don't remember crying, but I felt very tearful. And so that experience with Josephine Clark, I will never forget mm -hmm. her. So now you're at Boston, are you telling the story? So I was telling the story to Dr. Yes. Mays, and, and he said to me, <coughs> how do you think you're going to do this semester in the School of Theology where the reading lists are very long? Mm -hmm. We had to buy one of the syllabi, and it was over 100 pages. And when I raised my hand and said to the professor, which is the textbook in this bibliography? And the professor said, all of them. My little heart dropped. So I said to Dr. Mays, <coughs> I believe that if I can get through this first year without being on probation, I will have put together the formula of discipline, and proper study habits that I will be just fine. And if I finish the first year, that will be the Lord's way of telling me, you shall win the PhD. The second semester, we had a New Testament professor by the name of Donald Rollickson. He was not a good lecturer. And some of the students who were honor roll students dropped out of the class because they feared they were going to ruin their grade point average. And they took the course at Andover Newton <coughs> on the outskirts of the city, or in, in Newton, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so um, I couldn't do that, so I stayed. When I got my grades at the end of the second semester, I looked at them. I had uh, all good grades except one. I had a D in New Testament. And I didn't know what that meant. Because if you simply got your lowest grade was a C, you kept your scholarship. So I went to Dr. Robert Treese's office and I looked, showed him the grades and I asked him, I said, am I on probation? And I was very nervous. He looked at it and he said, I really don't know the answer to this. Let's go next door to the registrar's office. We went in and he, I must have been talking nervously because I remember him saying, calm down, Larry, calm down. <coughs> and when the registrar looked at the grades, he said, Congratulations, you are not on probation. Wonderful. And the universe said to me, Dr. Carter, 
<laughs> I knew that I would not be stopped because I had put to rest all of the naysayers. Well, they rewarded me and they got an internship for me at the Holy Cross United Methodist Church in Stockton, California for the summer. But this is really how I overcame a colossal inferiority complex. Because back then, black was not beautiful. Mm. Kinky hair, mm. dark skin, mm. thick lips, brown mm. eyes, wide nasal passages. Mm. Exactly. That was not the standard of beauty. I'm a child of the 1950s. And it was not unusual to hear black people say to youth, what would white people think of you if they saw you behaving that way? Mm. This inferiority complex had a fascinating spiritual effect because it kind of imposed on me a natural humility. I, um, I was there, but I was not too aggressive or bold and I listened a lot because I did not want to be an embarrassment to anybody, either in my speaking, and I listened intently, and I learned an awful lot. What got me through Boston University, my first degree, from 64 to 68, Every morning, I walked downstairs from the fifth floor <coughs> to the ground level of the School of Theology to the cafeteria, which was called the refectory. And while going down those steps, I constantly, my mantra was, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. All the way down every morning. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengtheneth me. <coughs> that... You see, when I remembered all the negative things that whites used to say about dark-skinned people, and I felt badly, I felt inferior, I felt unworthy, for a very short period of time as a kid, I considered committing suicide. But I, never, I, I must say that yeah. I've taken aback. Yeah. Continue, sir. But I never told anybody, not even my mother or my aunt. The thoughts went through my mind. I didn't entertain these thoughts for long, but they occurred at some really low points of my feeling rejected. <coughs> but the reason I didn't ever follow through, never picked up any weapon, never took any steps in that direction, just sat and entertained the idea. I don't have any need to be here. Nobody likes me. What stopped me was the fact that every Sunday and many times during the week, I was at church. And I remember in Sunday school and in vacation Bible school, <coughs> all of the emphasis on Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells, tells me, me so. so. And I started thinking theologically at a very early age, and I kept thinking, well, if Jesus loves me, and I know this, that I can't be all that bad. God loves me. There's nothing wrong with me. And those ideas pulled me back from the edge, caused me to critique my own musings, negative musings, and to conclude that something is wrong here in the culture and in society. 
and I must be a part of the solution. Wonderful. That is what saved me. <clears throat> Good. And I just kept on observing and getting off the beaten path. And it was in the 10th grade. One Sunday evening, I went to vacation. I went to um, the BTU meetings, mm -hmm. Baptist Training, Training Union. Union. What you're talking about. And when I arrived, <coughs> Mrs. Mary Glasscore and Mrs. Wiggs, my next door neighbor, met me and said, you're not going this evening to the BTU meeting. You're coming with us. And notice, my life is filled with these people who say, I'm taking you somewhere. See, they took me that evening across town to a church I'm going to tell you about that I'd never heard of or seen. One Sunday morning in the 10th grade, the superintendent of schools met me on Sunday morning and said, you won't be going to Sunday school this morning. I'm taking you across town. Mm -hmm. I said, across town? Where? He said, to the Union Grove Church to hear Martin Luther King Jr. I said, I can't go. He said, why? I said, my mother doesn't know. He said, yes, she does. I've already called her. <laughs> oh, wonderful. And she has a group. <laughs> he took me to meet Martin Luther King for the first of four times that I would meet him. And, and so this is when you're in the 10th grade. I was in the 10th. I just want to make sure I go. And <clears throat> when I remember, I mentioned when I was second semester of freshman year in college, my math teacher took me from the campus to hear Martin Luther King. Almost like guardian archangels mm. coming into my life, interrupting me, those three powerful times. And when Mrs. Uh, Mary Glasscore said, you're going with us to the first community church in Upper Arlington, Ohio, suburb of Columbus. The first community church was a white church, congregation, interdenominational with 40 two denominations under one roof. Wow. Now that was in the 1950s. That was almost unheard of. I could tell you a lot about this church, but let me just tell you one thing to give you an idea of where I had landed. They wanted to build a senior citizens village, this church. So they brought in a group of faculty from MIT to assess the giving power of the congregation and the report came back to them unlimited. Wow. 7,000 members active, 4,000 teenagers. Their pastor, Roy Abram Burkhardt, had a PhD from the University of Chicago that covered three fields, mm -hmm. religion, education, and abnormal psychology. Wow. And he integrated psychology into his entire ministry. Well, he had just retired. And the seminar they took us to at the church was on the origin of the races. In my life, <coughs> there are a series of Marys. It's phenomenal when I make the list of all of the Marys who intersected my life. You begin to get the feeling that something karmic is going on. Now, these are women whose names are actually Mary. Or Mary, who have impacted me. Well, the successor to Roy Burkhardt was Otis A. Maxfield, PhD in pastoral psychology and counseling from Boston University. I have never heard anyone more eloquent in my life than Otis A. Maxfield. To make a long story short, he wrote letters for all four of my degrees. And when it came to the PhD, he simply wrote a very short letter with about three or four sentences, the essence of which said, look at his record. And they admitted me to the PhD. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, 
I included him in my PhD dissertation. But it is the only place I've ever been to worship where people lined up in the halls and on the streets to get in. And when the sanctuary doors opened, as one congregation was coming out, because they had to have four Sunday morning services in order to accommodate the congregation, the people waiting in the halls would run to get seats. And this is in the 50s, 1950s? In the 1950s, wow. to hear Otis Maxfield, whose talents were off the scale. Maxfield used no notes, and he read by the yard. Wow. He could literally, let me just tell you this. On the day I arrived at his house with my dissertation for the PhD in my hand that included him, we sat on his porch and I handed him the dissertation. He took it, he flipped through the pages and they went by very rapidly. He did it again and handed it to me. And I was startled. I said, you're finished? He said, yes. I said, Otis, you didn't read that. He said, oh yes, I did. I was stunned and I almost didn't believe it. But then I remembered that while I was growing up in Columbus and he was the senior minister at First Community, he had a TV program once a week called A House Divided mm -hmm. where he counseled live unrehearsed couples who were having marital problems. So he would listen to them for about 20 minutes, describe their issues, and he would do some responding. And about five minutes before the program ended, he would turn from the couple and look into the camera, and he would then sum up the issue, analyze it, diagnose it, and do a prescription as to what he recommended with no notes unrehearsed. Mm -hmm. When he did that, the state of Ohio stood still to hear him. Because when he finished, all you could say was, my God. And to this day, I regret that I didn't do my dissertation on those mm -hmm. recordings. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but because of him, as well as Dr. King. They were the two mentors that made me know I should be at Boston University. Wonderful. Yeah. So now you, you, you are at Boston. Mm -hmm. How many degrees did you get at Boston? I got three. Three. Mm -hmm. Just briefly mm -hmm. tell us what degrees they, they were. Oh, I received the Master of <coughs> Divinity. Mm -hmm. At the time I got it, it was called the Bachelor of Divinity. Mm -hmm. So it changed <laughs> after you know, the JD was created for law schools. I received the Master of Sacred Theology in Pastoral Care and Counseling and the PhD. And uh, you know something, Dr. Barksdale? I'm thoroughly convinced that I got that degree in large measure because I wanted to better understand not just racism and interpersonal and social relations between people, mm -hmm. but I wanted to better understand me, the origins of inferiority feelings mm -hmm. and how to overcome them. So when you get a degree in psychology and counseling, it's not so much just the theoretical, philosophical experience, but psychologists are working on themselves. And you see, if you come out all right, then everything else will come out just <laughs> fine. <laughs> now, in what year did you get your doctorate at Boston? What year was that? <coughs> I finished, I defended the dissertation uh, in May of 1978. And uh, <laughs> I decided that I didn't want to receive the actual degree until the next commencement. 
one of the reasons was I found out that they were going to enlarge the degrees the next year, and I <laughs> wanted a larger one. <laughs> but also, they, I was invited to, by the dean of the chapel at Boston, where Thurman had served, to be the associate dean. And I thought that would be a good place from which to look around the country at what I wanted to do. And it turned out to be another one of those karmic experiences mm -hmm. <coughs> because at the end of that year I announced my wife was at Illinois working on her doctorate that I was leaving and I did not have anywhere to go well you will appreciate this I got a phone call from my wife and she said I have some bad news for you Dr. Sandy F. Ray has died. Cornerstone. Mm -hmm. Well, the world does not know this. Sandy F. Ray's brother raised my wife's mother oh, wow. in Dallas. Mm. And so I said, well, I guess your father is going to the funeral because the Rays came to our wedding in Waco, Texas and I had preached for him at Cornerstone. And my wife said, no, dad is not gonna be able to go. He has some conflict and mama is not going. I said, are you going? She said, no, I have to stay here and work on this degree. So I said, well, somebody in the family needs to be there, so I guess it falls on me. And I'm the closest to New York. Well, to make a long story short, because I'm so close to the family, I decided not to go to the church. Mm. From the airport, I went to the house on President Street. The morning of the funeral. When I arrived, of course, they recognized me instantly and they said, come on back to the kitchen and have breakfast. I walked through a sea of people whose faces I didn't even see. Ate breakfast with the family and then got up and walked back out toward the living room and looked around for somewhere to sit <laughs> and I saw an empty seat on the couch next to Daddy King. Wow. Now I've gotten ahead of my story but I sat down next to Daddy King and it was like old home week <laughs> because I had been his chauffeur for he and Mama King in Boston when Coretta brought the Board of Trustees of the King Center there. I helped her host them. <coughs> At some other time, I'll tell you about how that all came about. <coughs> so uh, we're sitting there, and there was this room full of people. Room full of people. And I looked up, and standing in the foyer was Hugh Gloucester, whom I had not seen in two years since I preached my candidating sermon at Morehouse College. First, pride came up in me. I hadn't heard from him in two years, and I said, well, I won't rush over there. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, now he is greatly your senior. You need to get up and reconnect with him. So I swallowed my pride, got up, walked over, and I said, Dr. Gloucester, do you remember me? He said, of course, yes. He said, how are you? I said, fine. I said, I have my PhD now. He said, I'm the associate dean at Marsh Chapel at Boston University. Well, he knew that. I said, but I announced last Sunday that I'm leaving. He said, where are you going? I said, I really don't know. My wife's in Illinois, and the only thing I have been offered out there is to be director of a dormitory. I said, I really don't know where I'm going. And he said to me, you know, we have not filled the deanship yet. I said, you haven't? I was really surprised. But I wasn't as surprised as I was when he then said, you know, you were the first choice of the search committee. <laughs> and you know, the first thought I had was, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I never got that out. Mm. And he said to me, why don't you stick with me today? So we got in the same limousine to go to the funeral. Well, I'm leaving a great deal out. 
But after we had come from the cemetery, I was on the sidewalk in front of the church shaking hands with different ministers. <coughs> and he walked over to me and he said, how do you know so many people? Because he had tried to introduce me to some people who said to him, oh, Hugh, we know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I explained to him the family connection. And he said, when you get back to Boston, I'm going to write you. Well, the next day, I, I stayed in the city one more day in order to attend a conference at the UN Church Center. Mm -hmm. I'm standing on the sidewalk across the street from the, the UN building, mm. talking to Moses William Howard, Otis Moss Jr., and a prominent New York City pastor. <laughs> I looked up, and a half a block away, I saw Dr. Kilgore really moving fast in our direction. I turned away and looked up again, and he was upon us. <laughs> and he said, I need to speak to you. And he called me over, and he said, are you aware that yesterday at the funeral, Dr. Gloucester was interviewing people about you? I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, I told him, Hugh, cease and desist. <laughs> Lawrence Carter is your man. Congratulations. You will be the first dean of the King Chapel. And what was your response? Oh, my God. <laughs> and I turned in a daze. And I was unaware of what he was doing as I was looking into space, contemplating everything that this meant. Being able to return to my native Georgia, which at the age of five, I didn't tell you, I didn't want to leave. So much so that I got sick on the train mm. between Dawson and Atlanta, so sick that the conductor persuaded my aunt that she should not take mm. me across the Mason-Dixon line. Wow. Mm. So we got off the train in Atlanta, and lived with relatives for a month until I got well. My whole system rebelled. And so here was the answer to the prayer that I had prayed, Lord, take me back mm. to my beloved Georgia. And you're back. And I'm back. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> You've been the only dean of the chapel very briefly. Uh, our time is limited, I know, and we're going to have to try to arrange another uh, follow-up interview but how would you in, um, summarize mm -hmm. your experiences as Dean of the Martin Luther King International Chapel? Oh, my goodness. I know, I know you can't give us the full mm. story. Right. Uh, Echo Nick's book on the King oh, Chapel yeah. is, is very good. To... Dr. Barksdale, I did not come here to practice my profession. I feel that I was summoned here. Being here was a calling. And it was a calling that seriously started on the night that Martin Luther King was killed. <coughs> it was Dean Mueller of the School of Theology who informed me during an intermission when my girlfriend, who later would become my fiance, we were watching a play on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and Dean Mueller came into the auditorium and asked one of our professors to step out. And when I inquired shortly after that why he looked so serious, he informed me that Dr. King had been shot and that 30 minutes later he had died. Mm. Marv and I left that theater that night at Boston University and walked down Commonwealth Avenue to the middle of the university into Marsh Chapel and sat in the dark on the back pew looking at the stained glass window of Jesus.
And I prayed out loud, Lord, help me to do something significant for Martin Luther King before I close my eyes. Amen. Well, that, the first answer to that prayer was when John Silver appointed me to be the head of the King Center, acting director at BU. Interrupted my doctorate, and for three years, I got them ready to invite a permanent person. And I went back to do my degree, but I knew I had not finished my tribute to Dr. King. So I prayed again for another opportunity. And so the invitation to come to Morehouse was the answer to that prayer. So this is what I mean when I say I was summoned. People said to me, you'll never get that job because you're not a Morehouse man. It never fazed me because the universe had said to me, that's your job. All you need to do is complete your doctorate and we will do the rest. And that's what happened. Wonderful. <laughs> You know, you've been here for how many years have you been the Starting dean? Starting now, my 38th yeah. year. Good, good. Yeah. And I think in those years, <clears throat> just like Dr. Mays has become so associated yeah. with Morehouse that we consider yeah. Dr. Mays to be a Morehouse man. Right. And uh, I think I can kind of accord that to you. I mean, a lot of people that I know um, believe that you are a Morehouse man, that you graduated from Morehouse. And, uh, so um, you are back at the, the school that you should have attended. <laughs> yes, that, that is what, I think really, that is why my son came here. Yeah. And of course it helped us financially, but we met, did not influence him. Yeah. We let him make yeah. the decision. Good, great. And so. Well, we want to thank you, Dr. Carter, for that wonderful um, uh, recalling of, of your, your experiences. I just have one question that I didn't ask early. Give us the name of your parents. I didn't, didn't get yes. that. Yes. My mother's name was Bernice May Carter, and she died Bernice Carter Johnson. She uh, married a second time. And uh, her maiden name was uh, Charles. And my father's name was John Henry Carter III. I was supposed to be John Henry Carter IV, but my mother said she didn't like the name. <laughs> <laughs> Are there siblings? Do you have siblings? Nope, I'm an only, only child. Only child. Oh, yeah. okay. Very wonderful. My mother had me when she was 18. And uh, I'm grateful. <laughs> Very good. Well, it's been a wonderful uh, um, interview. I've enjoyed hearing you. It's been inspiring, as a matter of fact, and I appreciate your candor. And once again, I want to thank you, Dr. Lawrence Carter, thank Dean you. of the Martin Luther King Chapel. Thank you, Dr. Marksdale.